This episode of 032 Conversations is sponsored by Cube Gallery, a progressive art space in Cebu, Philippines, providing network and exhibit opportunities for contemporary artists with whom they work closely with and promote beyond the local reach. For more than five years, the gallery has mounted shows of engaging artworks and have also represented the Visayas region in various international affairs. Currently in Cube Gallery, Kidlat. Kidlat's works have been archival in nature, believing that in order to elevate people's consciousness, mundane things and happenings should be given high regard. Kidlat's opening reception of mundane rituals is the name of the show. It opened last week. It was a huge success. Congratulations, Kidlat. We're happy for you. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast and this is the first time you've heard of Kidlat, the episode before this well, we interviewed him. I learned a lot. Very cool to talk to artists here in Cebu. Aside from the physical space of Cube Gallery in Crossroads, Vanilla, Cebu City, you can check their online collection on artsy.net slash cube dash gallery. The podcast is also sponsored by Hondurao Pizza. Uh, in the past year or two that I've been doing this podcast, I've had a lot of conversations with musicians and many of them have talked about how Hondura Pizza has been a great venue for local music. Even I myself had had plenty of memories playing music in Hondura Pizza, and it's an honor to have them sponsor the podcast. So if you're looking for a place to chill, a spot that supports local artists and musicians, a place to enjoy delicious homegrown pizza and ice-cold below-zero beer, Look no further. Visit Hondurao Pizza. They have many branches which you can find listed on their website at honduraopizza.com or you can have their wonderful pizza delivered to you via Grab Food or Food Panda. Thank you, Hondurao Pizza, for sponsoring the episode. Let's get to the show. Welcome to 032 Conversations, the podcast where we talk to creatives, see how they live, and how they do their work. I'm your host, Carlo Villarica. Life changing. Yeah, we just had a, the family and I just, we had a life changing decision over the weekend. We're selling our old, <laughs> reliable uh, pickup. Yeah, we have. Uh, I've been driving around a Toyota Hilux. I think it's like 2006, 2005, somewhere there. And, you know, with a growing family, with a wife and two kids, the Hilux has been getting a little tight. So we decided we're going to sell it and uh, we're going to get a new car, a new family-oriented car. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a big life changing decision. Now yeah, we're gonna get a new car. Um well you know, a second hand car. We found uh we found an Innova. And uh yeah, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. I'm not gonna get into the details about the car because I don't know much about cars. Really the basis of this purchase was that uh, there's a lot of space for the kids for their car seats, and there's a lot of space in the back for like laundry, <laughs> and there's also space for my bicycle in case we do need to bring it. So that's that's a good plus. It's it's comfortable, it's big, and most importantly, it's an automatic transmission car. the The reason being, the wife Steph really can't drive manual. And the way our the way our uh, lifestyle is right now is that she actually does a lot of driving because if I'm if I'm by myself I don't I don't drive I as you may know if you if you're a listener of the podcast you already know that I do a lot of my commute via bicycle it's just faster uh, driving is a pain in the ass so. So uh, the problem with the Hilux was that it's a manual car. One of the problems. It was, a, it was a manual car and, you know, she just can't use it. And we've decided we're going to be like a one-car 
family and this is the only car we have so we're gonna get rid of it and uh, we got ourselves an innova yeah hey yeah just uh life changing this i I must I'm, I'm gonna admit like we've used the innova for like a day now like a day or two and it's it's been much more comfortable in a sense there's just more space in the back for the kids and their their stuff you know having two kids the two car seats and then there's a bag that goes with them all the time they also like to snack all the time uh, there's a lot of it's a whole thing whenever you want to travel with the kids so the innova makes it a little bit easier at least for us yeah that's what's been happening life changing decisions i mean i'm going to be sad like i i i really loved that high looks it was really awesome one time we brought we drove the high looks all the way to asmenia peak and we had friends in the back and they were just toasting outside yeah anyway got the innova this episode is also sponsored by kent combs full disclosure Kent Combs is owned by a really good friend and co-founder of 032, Jason Almendras. And if there's one guy I trust who has good taste, who likes cool things, it's Jason. So I'm pretty sure Kent Combs is awesome. I mean, don't take my word for it. Get, try it yourself. But like before he got married, I believe his description and his social media, Jason's social media was like... Uh, I think it was like something like I like nice things, which was code for like he really likes cool, really fashionable, really high quality stuff. So if Jason decides to to bring something in to sell something, I know it's really good. So get yourself a comb from Kent Combs. You can get Kent Combs in the assembly online. I'm going to put a link to the show notes. But if you head over to assembly.032.com, you're going to see it there. There's a whole bunch of combs to choose from. So guys, it's time to stop using your girl's hairbrush and get yourself a decent comb. And not those mass-produced things you get in the grocery. I'm talking about Kent Combs. Kent Combs are handmade combs from Britain's oldest hairbrush manufacturer. Do your hair a favor, buy a Kent comb. Kent combs have rounded teeth which ensure a smooth and comfortable action that glides effortlessly through the hair without scratching or damaging the hair or scalp. You can follow them on Instagram at Kent Philippines or you can order a comb online at the assembly online. You can use the promo code Kent. That's Kent, K-E-N-T, for a 10% discount. Yeah. Just head over to assembly.032.com and you can look for the Kent collection and anything you order from the Kent collection with the promo code Kent, you get a 10% discount. Thank you, Kent Combs, for sponsoring the podcast. I've said this before and I'll, I'll say it again. Starting a business is a huge creative pursuit. And one of the things that I wanted to do with this podcast was not only to talk to to artists, musicians, um, people doing what we would consider artistic, creative work, but I also wanted to talk to entrepreneurs. And I did that a little bit in the past. And then today is another day of me getting to talk to an entrepreneur. Starting a business is really hard to do. It needs a ton of knowledge and patience, but at the same time, you need to come up with creative solutions to problems. So one of the biggest problems when starting a business is making that choice to start. That's something I was particularly interested with when I talked to Bunny Pajes. He famously started his business at age 49. In fact, he was turning 50 that year uh, when we were talking in the podcast. He, he explained that. And now, Pahas Holdings, that's his company, it was organized on August 2003. Less than 20 years later, they're a leader in Cebu's growing food industry. It's very likely that you've been to many of their restaurants or tried so many of their products. They have a ton of restaurants. Just to name a few, you have Lantau, 
Cafe Racer, Shaka, Moon Cafe, House of Lechon, Thirsty. You know, even a funny, funny story about Moon Cafe. That was, that was where I met my wife, actually. Yeah. I met her in Moon Cafe. I was drinking with some friends and then she caught up with her cousin and I met her there uh, back in the day. And it was also the spot of our first uh, first date, Moon Cafe. Yeah, some sentimental memories there. And yeah, so anyway, Bunny Pajas, incredible entrepreneur. I, I was really interested with his story and, and, and that choice to start a business, especially at age 49. So we talked about it. I learned a lot. It was actually really fun to talk to him. Before we get to the episode, before we get to the interview, uh, I'm going to be hosting an Ask Me Anything anytime soon. So if you are interested in asking a question, you can send an email to info at 032.com. That's 032 in letters. The subject line, question. And uh, yeah, just ask me anything. And uh, if it's a good one, I'll... Include it in a future episode. And also, if this is your first time to listen to 032 Conversations, subscribe to the podcast. We have a new episode every Tuesday, and you can find this podcast anywhere you can find podcasts. Subscribe. Let's get to that interview with Bunny Pajes. Uh, wait, second. Before we get to that, just so I can, fi- I can finish this, uh, for Levels, uh, what did you have for breakfast? I had uh, salmon belly and Chinese chorizo and egg and uh, atsara. That's oh. it. No rice. No rice. No rice. You stopped doing rice uh, in a no, while? No, I've stopped doing rice uh, for a long, long time. It's it just really bloats you up. Yeah, and I've so been able to manage. I've been able to manage my weight pretty well in the last two years. And oh, yeah? you, you can manage your weight with a uh, weighing scale uh-huh. and portioning eating that's basically what it is so wherever i go even if i travel i just practice my my portioning eating i just put portions on my plate and that's it i don't go back anymore otherwise it's so difficult to lose weight oh yeah 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 lose the a lot of it is really just what you eat and i've lost what i lost 20 20 pounds i was about 220 two yeah i was 220 before and now i'm 196 oh really oh wow yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. So, but I've been able to maintain it in in the last two years. So that's I think that's the more challenging thing. Mm, how do you do the the portion eating? I'm curious. Like, uh... no, really, just a small part, small part of fish, small part of chicken. And I said, okay, I'm gonna eat the best food that I can I can afford to take, but really just small portions. And I mm. do that for breakfast, for dinner, and and lunch. And if I go to a buffet party, I do the same thing. Just when I see a lot of people in, in the same table that I have, they really just put a mountains of food on their on their plate. I just put in a little, and then I stop. And they all look. They all look at Bunny how disciplined he is. But that's the way to go. In fact, recently there has been a very very extensive study on whether exercise can help you reduce weight. None, zero, practically mm. zero. It's really the food intake, and I've been practicing that for the last. Two years, yeah. And with it the works. Food, I I notice. Well, I don't know if it's zero. If it's zero, not effect, zero, but but it's, unless you really go for that hyper, you know, like training for a marathon or training for the triathlon or something like that. But ordinarily, people who go to the gym, they just exercise this for an hour. Yeah, you see a lot of these guys. Unfortunately, they never really. You don't see them. You know, having lost weight, this is probably as big as they I, were before. I think generally, like if you exercise for an hour, maybe that's five hundred calories. But really, that's you just eat, eat three thousand. Yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> up to that, so you actually gain. That's a that's a Big Mac. Yeah. So I really <laughs> just tell people, okay, exercise helps. I think it's good for your for your body, good for your health. But in terms of losing weight, very very little effect. Very little. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Do you add, do you have like an exercise? Routine? Yeah, I, no, I exercise, but I have a, I have a gym in the house. Mm. I run around. I have a treadmill. I have a, a stationary bike. I have weights. So, but I I'm trying to just minimize my not minimize, but really control my exercise too, because you cannot go with too much exercise. It's also unhealthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Especially if you're getting in a little bit on age already. Mm. Okay. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're, so, you're still very, very young, so you have no trouble with that. Uh, you know, I don't know. Huh? Uh, I'm in my 30s. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I remember I went, I went to the U.S., And then I think in the U.S. a few years ago, and then I after getting there, like just kept eating whatever, and then I came back. I had as twenty pounds heavier. Wow, that's in 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 a span of how long? Like a month or something. You know, you can easily easily gain weight if I eat rice and really just load it up, maybe for the next week or so. I probably could easily gain maybe about eight to ten pounds. Yeah. Very very quickly. Yeah, very. So, If I really just intentionally load up and eat rice and all the food, because I like well, everybody likes to eat, right? Yeah, especially we're in the restaurant business. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> and we we usually we we test all our all our stuff here in the office. So we have a commissary at the back, and oh, yeah? lunchtime. So they just say, okay, testing for let's say top of Cebu or Moon Cafe or for Lantau. So it's all here in the in the boardroom. So Is that like a regular occurrence? It is a regular occurrence because we keep on testing, we keep on trying to new new products, improving them. So it's it's all here. So imagine if I don't control my eating, you could imagine. Yeah, it, it's easy to go overboard. Very very easy, oh, especially for you. I'm but, sure. But you yeah. cannot you cannot manage it unless you have a weighing scale. So what I do, mm. Carlo, is I really keep track of my weight. You know, if you look at my, I'll show you later. But I have a I have a sort of a table every day when I not every day, but. Maybe three times or two times a week at least. Oh yeah. So I, I weigh myself and I put it in a in, in a piece of paper. So I see I see the the progress or how things are are moving. If I lose too much weight, then I eat more. If mm. I'm starting to gain, I just sort of lower it down a little bit as far as my intake is concerned. So that's it. So that's that's how you manage your weight. There's no other way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you don't measure. You don't Anything. measure. You cannot measure. What you cannot measure, you cannot manage. Yes, exactly. Same in business as in your weight. Yes, and then I was I was thinking I was I was wondering where to to start this interview, and then the nice thing we are we starting is, or still not? This is this is all in it basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's like a yeah. We're just talking um, because I was wondering where to start, and then the nice thing with you is that you know there really is quite a bit. About you online, right? Um, so I was thinking maybe a good way to to get it going is like, uh, what's your? Because your story has been featured countless times. So for someone who doesn't know, can you just maybe reiterate or quickly how did you start? Because I think you you spent a couple of a lot of a lot of years in the insurance industry, right? And I believe you started a business at age forty nine. Yeah, really, I was nearing forty. Actually, fifty that year, nineteen ninety six. But my birthday is November, and I retired from Manufacturers Life Insurance Company of Canada in March. So I was forty nine, but I turned fifty that year. So that was one of the biggest decisions I had to make in my life, and I, I guess one of the best because Ooh. it changed it changed my life and and the lives of my family members. To start a business, yeah, to start. I, you know. I think it's the desire of many, many Filipinos. I'm not sure if it's most most Filipinos to really be their own bosses, but it's not easy to do. And I guess it was the right time to do it. And and I guess you can say I was in a hurry because I didn't have much time left. Were you, you know, in a hurry you, at forty nine? <laughs> no, when when you're fifty, you say you know you don't have many more many more years left. Basically, I mean you're you're at thirty. So you still have what, maybe forty more years left. At at fifty, you may have what maybe twenty years, twenty five years, thirty years left. But but I think I was prepared. I was prepared. The life insurance business prepared me for it. Like in what in what ways? I would like to. That's something that I'm curious about. Your decision to start a business at age forty nine. Now, like you know, you see. It's it's not an easy decision. No, number no, one, no. right? So I'm curious about that moment because it would have been very easy, I assume. Because I'm going to make a few assumptions here. Sure. That uh, at when you were working in the insurance industry, I, it, it seems like you were fairly successful in the insurance. Pretty industry. good, yeah. It was, I was pretty good. Believe me, it's pretty good. I was head of the Visayas in Mindanao. I was I was earning pretty well. And 
I was I was uh, improving in the company, growing, but I still I wasn't happy anymore. Mm, I wasn't I wasn't happy maybe for about a year and a half. In other words, I wasn't excited to get up in the morning and really go out there and and do it. And and that's me. Uh, I think I haven't done many many things. I can't say zero, but practically zero thing that I am not passionate about. Mm. So if I'm not passionate about it, I don't do it. Assuming I have an option. But if I don't have an option, then I like, I, I, I get to like it and I become passionate and, and do it. To me, that's no longer a problem. It's a condition. So that's what happened. I wasn't happy. I was doing very well. I, my future, I think, was good, but I wasn't happy anymore. For, for a simple reason that it was a business that I couldn't transfer or pass on to my children. Mm, okay. No, no, I'm not criticizing the life insurance industry, but it's always, they always say it's your business. But in reality, it's not really your business because your clients and your entire business, when you leave the business of life insurance, actually they pass it on to, to the company. You cannot retain your clients. Yeah. Yeah, because it would have been, I feel like at that point when you made that decision, there was a way. There was a way of it just going. You know, if you, if you if you just rolling around, ro- rolling on, and just keep just keep on going, you know. And um, so I was curious about that. And then it's not like I think because okay, I, I'm gonna s- speak a little bit of your story. So when you when you retired, you decided to start a business, but you didn't start. Because now, obviously, there's Pius Holdings, there's a lot of businesses under, but you didn't start with, you know, 10 restaurants or, or 20 uh, thirsty stalls all at once. I believe it was the first thing was a playhouse. Yeah, we had, we had playhouse, we had playroom, we had playhouse. And these businesses had really been built one, one brick at a time. Yeah, because I think my sister... It was in Paradise Village. Yes. And I was a kid. I was in high she, school or she something. She studied with us for a she while. She studied with you guys. A, classmate, a, a your... classmate, I think, of, of Michael, my youngest son. You know, I don't know. No, my sister, she was born in 1990. So I'm not, I think you're, I don't know how, how old Michael is. Michael is about, yeah, more or less that age. Maybe I don't really, was. you know, it's hard. I don't really, hard to remember the ages of your kids if you're, uh, oh, well, <laughs> if you have, you have five kids. <laughs> Well, yeah, but anyway, so I think she was one of your first students. Right. They, they started with five, I think, and she was one of the first students. She was Pro- one of the five. Yeah, I don't know if she was like on the first year that you guys were open, <laughs> right? But I know that I remember Playhouse. It was in this garage. Yes, I it- converted my garage. It was a, a single car, and we were renting that house there in that corner of EY. Yeah. And there was a space, so we decided to put up a school. So I put up a, it was just made of cocoa lumber. Yeah, and it, was, then it was a room. It, it was a room, and then I moved my car. I remember I had a, a black black Honda, Honda Accord then. I was still with the company, so we started uh-huh. at school from, from scratch. And, and now the school has grown to about 700 students in, in, a, in a good campus here in Vanilla. So you can say that we started in a, in, in a backyard, in a, in a garage, like a uh, some of those major, major companies, yeah, like Apple or Ford. I'm, I'm curious. Did you feel like at that time, when you started it, did you feel like it was a big risk, or was it something that, since you, you know, you already spent so many years in the, in the insurance industry, and then, you know, so like it's, you kind of, it, it wasn't as if, this was a. This was a uh, that you needed this to be a home run. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. was it something that you were relatively comfortable doing, and then just seeing where it goes? Well, you know, at that time, I, it wasn't too much of a risk because I was still with Manual Life. Mm. But when we started to build a school and when we started to build Thirsty, the, the fresh juice business, I had to make a decision to quit because it's so difficult. I think to go into business when you are not focused. I mean, you really have to take those risks. If you don't, then you can't grow. Like in my book, people ask me, Bunny, how do you define and what's an entrepreneur in your book? 
mean, to me, uh, the, the most simple definition of all that I think covers everything there is that to me, an entrepreneur is someone who sees a business opportunity, we, is willing to take a risk or those risks and, and builds an organization to pursue it. So if you see an opportunity, then you put up a business and then you just stay in that level for a long, long time or forever, then you're not a, a real entrepreneur. You are a businessman maybe, but not an entrepreneur. So it was just the start of the business. We grew it. We started to add more more companies into the business. And now we have over a thousand employees working for us. So it's, it's a great satisfaction. And people tell me, People ask me, do you have a lot of headaches? I said, no, it's just that you need to, to choose the right people. You need to set up the organization and you develop those systems and implement them. Well, these are very challenging opportunities and challenging things. But I think if you if you have the right mindset, I think things will go pretty well. Uh, of course, they never totally go 100% well. But as long as you make good adjustments along the way and you keep on learning and leveling up, that's it. Mm. So when when you so so when when you guys bought Thirsty, there was that point where you decided that ah so is that what happened? So before you retired, you already had Thirsty. Okay, what happened there is we put up the school, it's mm-hmm. a small school, and then we we put up playroom, playroom because I was in I was still with Manual Life and I went to Davao to train some of our agents. And then I went to this mall. I, if I remember, I think it was Victoria Mall in in Davao. Okay. And I saw this place. It was a small room with green carpeting. And there were kids there playing. And then I went inside. What is this? He said, this is a daycare center where parents leave their kids while they shop. And I said, wow, this is a good idea. How much do you charge? I think 30 pesos per hour or something like that. And I said, this is a good idea. So it just struck me, but I, I was still with Manual Life at that time. So when I went back to Cebu the following day, I right away approached SM. Mm. And then I talked to them and gave them the idea. And they said, yeah, sure. So we put up Playroom beside the food court of the SM here in Cebu City. And when I was there in Playroom running the running the business together with my family, then I, well, the food court was beside it, right? Yeah. So... At the corner, if you remember, and it's still there, at the corner of the of the food court on the left side, there was this counter called Thirsty. Okay. So I went there to buy. Uh, I couldn't afford much, so I bought the cheapest, which was banana shake. I remember at 10 pesos per, for the regular size. <laughs> and this girl who was there in the counter, Shirley was her name, I remember. She said, sir, can we apply with you? And I said, Why? I said, well, it looks like the owner is no longer very, very interested in running the business because she hasn't really been meeting us and not attending to it. And I said, oh, she might want to sell it. I mean, just out of the blue because I I thought that it was a good opportunity because it was sort of a healthy product, fresh fruits and the drinks. I said, Shimai, so I got the number and this is owned by Margie Osmania at the time, the, the daughter of the vice mayor of Cebu City, Renato Zmeni at the time. This was way back, Carlo, in 1996, would you believe? So that's over 20 years ago. Yeah. So I contacted Margie and we bought the business together with John, my eldest son. I remember it was quite high at the time, but there were two outlets. And we bought it for, I think, including Lux Stock and Barrel for about 190,000 pesos. But there was about 90,000 pesos in security deposit. At that time, there was a one in the food court, one in the food court in Ayala, and the other one was in the supermarket of Kaisano, Kaisano Mall. Okay. I thought yeah. there was an SM. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. There was one in SM. Okay. You're right. There was one in SM and another one in the supermarket of of, uh, of Ayala. Oh, okay. Owned by the Gaisanos. Mm. So we bought it and then we we paid. We took over November 16, 1996, which happened to be my birthday. Oh. And the first day we went to Carbon to, to buy fruits. So it's, uh, it's a long story. And the two outlets, I remember our first month sales was 58,000 pesos for both outlets. Okay. But now Thirsty is oh, flashback, you know, we moved back 20 years. We now have over 200 outlets. 
about I think about two hundred employees for thirsty or more. So it's it has gone a long, long way. Was it something that just funded itself? Yeah, it was just it was just that. And I remember when I started to grow it, John said, "Dad, how can we grow this business? We we don't know much about it." I said, "Don't worry, John. We'll let's we'll learn along the way." And even today, at you know, twenty years later, we're still learning every day. So you can't wait when all the you know the, all the signs on the streets turn white, red, or, or green before you leave the house. You just have to do it and then go ahead and make adjustments along the way. I think that's that's it. So it's a story for thirsty. I wonder, is it some? Did you see something in Thirsty? Uh, or was it at the? I'm I'm trying to think because you know obviously those twenty years ago. For all I know, that was the only shop selling uh, healthy fruit drink. Now, obviously, you you mentioned a lot, you guys. a lot of competition. Uh huh. Yeah, a lot of competition. Yeah, like you guys were in it very early. So yeah, we were, and you know, I saw that there was a, a movement for healthier drinks. And people were getting more conscious of exercise and getting more conscious of eating healthier foods. So that's what happened. So that's what I saw. Mm. But who could who would have known that this would grow to what it is? So we started with Thirsty. And would you believe that it took us 10 years later before we went into the restaurant business? So it, it wasn't like at that time we had a school. We had playroom for a while. And then eventually we had to close playroom because there were just too many competitors in the mall. And what has happened is that the malls now really do not give much protection for, for the, for the type of businesses that you're in. There was a time when, you know, the mall will tell you, okay, we will protect you. You'll be the only one there. But what happened to playroom, my playroom is that there were just so many that opened later on in, in SM here. Whereas there was only us at that time for many, many years, just my playroom. Eventually there, became five all in all so the business just started to really go down and we were not making enough profits anymore to justify it so we closed everything yeah so the competition became this is this reminds me of so as i was doing some research you have it's it's funny because you also as i was walking up here it's also on the bulletin board downstairs like you have these um uh, on, on the bulletin, there's a poster. It says, I think it's called I Believe, and then there's like 15 points there or something. <laughs> Things I Believe in or something yes, like that. Yes, yes. And then I think one of them is uh, go to Blue Oceans. Yes. Have you heard Have you heard of that strategy? Yeah, yeah well, uh, I heard it from you. Okay, yes. Correct, correct, correct. <laughs> can, you, like, can you just, uh, you know, for the listener, can you explain that a little bit? It, remi- it just reminded me of that when you were yeah, talking. Yeah, there, there's this book that really became a bestseller. It's called Blue Ocean Strategy. And the idea is that if you want to go into business and succeed, you need to take a look at businesses that are not too crowded, where the competition eats up on each other. Now, that type of business is actually what is called a red ocean. Like there's so many sharks and so bloody. And the concept of these guys, Mulborn and and, and Chan, I think the author's, is that you should operate in what is called a blue ocean, where it's serene, competition is is not that heavy, and that's where you should operate. And and I think that had an impact on me. And every business that we go into now, I always ask my children, because we're together in the business, all of us, that, is this red ocean or blue ocean? And that's what happened. So when you think about Thirsty at the time, it was really blue ocean. And Playroom was also Blue Ocean. But eventually, it became Bloody Ocean. But one thing good with Thirsty is I think we were way, way ahead. And we have continually improved the the concept, the product, and really promoted pretty well that it has retained its position. I think it's a very, very strong brand right yeah. now. Not only for ourselves, but we've franchised it a lot already in so many places in the Visayas and Mindanao. So the Blue Ocean strategy, I think, is one concept that entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs should look at closer mm. blue ocean strategy is that the name of the book blue ocean yeah, the, strategy? Uh, the name of the book is the blue ocean strategy okay you I... can google it and you can study it the concept is very simple but also not very very easy as, as always not very easy to, to to do because i think i think you're balancing this the, the, what what came to mind to me was when you think of blue ocean so it's something that has not as much competition, that sort of thing. But also at the same time, you have to see if that ocean, that market, 
is it worth entering? Correct. But it's very important. In fact, let, let me just cite some examples, our own experience or my own experience. Like if you if you look at Top of Cebu, our, our restaurant over there, it's, you know, that's basically blue ocean when we started. Although recently there had been several that opened after us, but we, we were first. And I think we got the best view, we got the best food and the best service there. So despite the fact that the others have opened around us, we've been affecting, but not as much. Uh, we'll also talk about Lantau yeah. in Cordoba. You know, yeah. I think that's blue ocean. It's right on the ocean, though, but it, that's blue ocean. <laughs> so it's, uh, in fact, when we opened that, people thought I was, I was stupid or crazy to put up a restaurant there because just from Cebu City, it takes about two hours to get there. The roads it's are narrow, the traffic, but if you go there, it's, it's wonderful. You know, it's just an amazing place where you see the entire Cebu the- Island light up and everything. So it's, it's amazing and, and it has retained its, its competitive edge. So it's the same with the things that we're doing. A cafe racer is, is very different. It's a diner. Thirsty is still a little bit of a blue ocean right now because it's the only one that I'm calling the healthy way. Mm. So I think in some way we have actually implemented and really been doing this blue ocean strategy to a large extent of what we're doing. Yeah, because I th- uh, at least I was thinking about like Top of Cebu. There, you you have competitors, but really, how many people can open? It's like limited. It's not like a mall where you go into a mall and then really there are there's space for so yeah, many competitors. Right, right. But if you go out to up to Cebu, you know it's it's still tops. I was there recently in tops, and it's largely the same <laughs> as it was <laughs> twenty years I ago. I know, I know, and they charge the one hundred pesos just to go in there and enjoy the view. Like in in our case, at top of Cebu, we don't actually charge entrance, so there's no minimum. There's no minimum charge. Oh yeah, and then it's a much more. I've been to top of Cebu also. It's Thank a, you. It's a much more. Uh, uh, I feel like relaxing. True, <laughs> true. Uh, but yeah, get, but now you have to line up. Like there is people <laughs> it's who go cool. there. Yeah. If you go there, don't worry. You just text me. I can reserve for you. Oh. So. <laughs> It helps. A lot of my friends uh, call me or text me and say, Bunny, can I do me a favor? You know, it's strange because they're the ones asking me favors just to go to a restaurant, which I think is is very elating uh, type of feeling, though. Mm. So, Why do you find that strange? Well, you know, we I'm very thankful for people patronizing our restaurant, Carla. And in fact, one of the basic principles that I really emphasize in our company is that the main purpose of our business is to create more satisfied customers. It's the only thing that I keep on emphasizing and I repeat all over and over again. It's, okay, now, guys, the main purpose of our business is to create satisfied customers. If we do that in a grand scale, we will succeed. If we don't, then we fail. Yeah, I've I've read that as well. Uh, I was wondering <laughs> about that because where... I know that you have all these rules... Or stuff that you believe in. Yeah. Uh, I find that really interesting because at what point did you decide to, you know, to write it down? To, do you get what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Because like, like there are certain things that, like some concepts that I believe in, but like I've never... I mean, I think now I should. Now that <laughs> now that I've you uh, read You've yours. got a lot of exposure to people... So many aspects of development or even businesses, right? So I'm sure you have your own concepts and beliefs. Write yeah. them down. No, that's why. That's why. So I'm curious. How did that? Uh, how did you decide to, you know, put up these bullet points? Like I've seen a version of it online. There's like 21. No, I wrote also 21 things that I've learned as an entrepreneur, or something mm. like that. Yeah. The first one that I wrote there is that I believe that a business is a is a it's a blessing from from the Lord that's given to you to, to to nurture, to grow, and to share with other people. So when I talk about that in my speeches, I can see people really feeling it, and I and I believe that no matter what you do, and if it's not given to you, it's you, you can't you can't have it. And and when you are given that, you should take care of your blessings because it's a blessing. And I think that's sad because so many people who are blessed. Just don't take care of their blessings well. Like what? Like what do you mean? 
Well, some people are, are blessed with resources, with money, even intelligence, but they, they just squander them. And yeah. I've seen that. I think what has happened in, in our case is that when we're blessed with something, we, we try and really make sure that that blessing is, is taken care of. We focus and we, we focus and we do everything that we can to maximize that blessing. There, there's this book. Have you read those books? Uh, the books of Jim Collins, Good to Great. Oh no, I have not. You should. He. Well, that's that's a good Bible for for business. And he wrote a second book. It's Great by Choice. And in chapter fourteen, I remember. You should probably check that out. He said that the there's, there's a discovery that he sort of concept that was sort of dubbed as one of the greatest discoveries of the 21st century in business. Uh-huh. It's called. R O L, okay. Re- return on luck. Okay. So, and he basically studies is that successful people, successful countries, and businessmen generally get the same amount of luck or or bad luck, but the successful ones were able to turn their bad luck into good luck, and the ones who did not actually failed or performed less. So he said, if you get lucky. You should right away make sure that you maximize that. But I sort of did that a little one step higher. I said, return on blessings. So you should maximize your blessings. Mm-hmm. And also that's 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 what that's what I'm trying to do. Not easy because sometimes you get distracted, you get you lose focus and sometimes maybe your head gets bloated a little bit. But you should just go back to the basics. Take care of your blessings. Maximize also your return and luck. Sorry oh. to be philosophical here. Oh, but, yeah. No, that's you know, great. This is something that, that, that's something that I really believe in strongly. Yeah. I've heard that book uh, recommended. I listen to a lot of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, one, of my, one of my problems is that I, I, I find it difficult to read. So, I used to just download a lot of audiobooks. Yeah. Do you learn a lot from them? The audio books? Yeah, yes. Oh yeah, for yeah, sure. I, I listen to. Yeah, I watch. I watch TED Talks too. Oh yeah, like TED Talks. Yeah, it's yeah. good because they're just what within twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm um, I'm curious also because I think in in so I was reading up a little bit and then you talk about that you're inspired to do business by um, Doctor Noberto Kisumbing. Oh yeah, you remember? <laughs> yeah, so he's the founder of Norcus yes. Norcus Trading. Really great guy. And then I think you you have a story where you saw him in a party, and then you know you felt compelled to say to say hi or talk to him, no. Uh, but that's all you said. So I'm curious: did you ask anything? Uh, how, what did you learn from him? That's you know because it, he inspired you to do business. I am assuming there's some there's some learning there. Definitely. Yeah. Well, what happened was years and years ago, one of my favorite magazines was the Executive Digest. Mm. It was there was a, a Philippine version. They started, I think, in the states. It's a compilation of really nice articles on management and leadership and entrepreneurship. And and in one of the, the those issues, I saw him on the cover of Executive Digest. So I bought a copy. And I said, you know, I want to, I want to meet this guy. I was reading his story, how he built Norcus Trading to a billion peso company. And when I saw him in a party, I said, oh, I've, I've got to approach this guy. So I introduced myself. We talked and we became really, really good friends over the years. And several times we've had sessions. I visited him at his office. One time he invited me for dinner and we talked. And at that point he said, you know, buddy, you should just take the leap. And, so you didn't have a you you weren't a, you didn't have a business. No, yet. I didn't have a business at that time. I, I was working with Manulife. I was head of the Visayas in Mindanao. So, and and you see, if you keep on thinking about something, and and this is and I believe this still. This is the law of attraction. You just you focus on the things that you like to happen instead of the things that you don't like to happen. So I was just focusing on maybe attracting businesses that come my way, and. It's it's strange because all these locations that we got, most of them really just landed on on our laps. And as long as you keep on thinking and you you clear your mind of so many destructions, you are ready for anything. And and there's a book that I recommend. By the way, it's written by a guy who is the 
number one expert on productivity in the world. His name is David Allen. He was the guy who wrote this book, uh, Getting Things Done. And he wrote a second book. It's called Ready for Anything. It's a it's, it's a thin book because it's just a 52 chapters and short essays on how to improve your productivity in terms of business and life. And I use that as one of the things that I really keep on learning and going back to. So David Allen, Ready for Anything. It's, it's a book that I highly recommend. So what happened was uh, I became good friends with, uh, I call him NQ. His name is Tutsi Kisume. He's still very much alive and running his business. He's now 80, 82 or 83 years old already. So that sort of inspired me and, and prodded me to go into business. Uh, just his story. In just general. his story and when I talked to him. Mm. And I said, go for it. So over the years, I, I sort of sat down with him. I just gave him an account of what happened. And he was so proud. I said, oh, Bunny, well, you really did very, very well. And just continue. I need to visit him soon. I haven't seen him in a long, long time. So, <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, this is life. You, you, get, you meet somebody who inspires you. And that's what I'm trying to do with my life. And I hope with what I've been doing all these years now in trying to inspire entrepreneurs, the other day I was part of, I'm part of this Mentor Me program of the Department of Trade and Industry where we mentor startups, uh-huh. new entrepreneurs, and share with them our experiences. And so many of these fellow entrepreneurs are, are doing this with me in the Cebu Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It's, it's a very good program, I think, that our DTI Secretary, Mon Lopez, has done for the country in the last two to three years. Oh, really? So how do these startups apply? Yeah, you've got to be in business like for a year or two before you can apply because it's very difficult, I think, to be able to relate to somebody who has, hasn't been in business. Then you apply through DTI, through the chambers, and then DTI will review, and then you can you become a mentee. And it's an, it's an 11-week program where, where volunteers – Entrepreneurs, they, they actually give talks, lectures for 11 weeks. Mm. And then after that, before you graduate, you are asked to present your improvement plan to a panel of entrepreneurs and also mentors. Like this is what happened last, when was this, last uh, Saturday in, in Azea Suite. I was one of those uh, friends of mine. So there were three of us. So there were three guys who presented about 35 minutes their improvement plans. And then we make suggestions, we critique them, we give them ideas on how to keep on uh, getting better and, and to move forward. So it's a good one. It's a good one. It's called Mentor Me Program. Kapatid Ko Mentor Me Program or something like that uh, by DTI in cooperation with the Cebu Chamber of Commerce and Industry for Cebu. How do you get into this? So like I noticed... Like we were talking just earlier, you you have a talk like later tonight. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm I'm hosting an event. Are you hosting an event sponsored by Credit Suisse and uh, Mandawi Chamber of Commerce. Uh-huh. And they've asked me. They've invited this director, uh, executive director of the Singapore Economic Development Council, a lady. His name, her name is uh, Krista Bell Fu. Yeah, it was I noticed because so like, um, so again, I was doing some research, and then I noticed that. You actually do quite a bit of speaking, and even uh, you even did like I, there was a show on YouTube. There was like a clip on YouTube where you were interviewing, uh, my uh, your auntie, my auntie, yeah, 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 <laughs> Ingrid, then, Ingrid, Ingrid, Santa, Sala, Maria. Santa Maria, yeah, and then <laughs> <laughs> you saw must that must have been yeah, must have been <laughs> years ages, ago, <laughs> ages, uh, over twenty years ago, I guess. Yeah, so. Uh, I'm curious, uh, where, I mean, why, why do that? Why do these, you know, these, these things? Why host the, an event? Why be a mentor? The, men, the mentor thing I can get a little bit. But like, why do, at that point in the 90s, why did you do that interview show? Um, I'm just curious. Well, you know, well, not many people know this, but I was growing up with a very strong sense of inferiority complex. And I was, when I was in, in elementary school, I was very skinny. I was so thin. My classmates used to call me skeleton. Okay. And so this really, I felt so inferior. And I was a stammerer. I could hardly speak straight. I did not have confidence in myself. And But I did something about it. I went to the gym for several years. 
And when I was in high school at the University of San Carlos Boys High in Mango Avenue, I used to take a Jeep. I didn't, we didn't have a car then. So when I went to this gym in, in downtown, it was called Mr. Philippines because it was run by a, by a former winner of Mr. Philippines. So I went to the gym and when I became, when I was about 18, 19 years old, I was good enough to join a physique contest oh, really? called Junior Mr. Visayas at the YMCA. Oh, wow. Okay. I've, got, I've got pictures to, to prove <laughs> that it's true. So I joined this contest. This is the one where they put oil in your body, you warm up at the back, and then they play music, and then you pose for about three minutes. Mm. And wow, then there's three judging. Minutes, yeah, huh? it's, it's like a, this Mr. Universe contest yeah. in uh, Mr. Philippines. So. So I had ambition to, to, to become a, a Mr. Philippines or even a Mr. Universe. So, and then I, I placed fourth. There were only four contestants, but anyway. <laughs> so, but that sort of changed my life. Uh, the value of exercise and taking care of your body. So I don't drink. I don't smoke. Uh, really just stay most of the time at home when I, I don't have functions to go to. And then I practice my speaking. I just, I, my mother gave me a tape recorder and I volunteered. So this is a gradual process of doing it. So you see, anybody can improve the way he or she speaks by practicing and imitating other people. So I started to volunteer. I was a reader in church where we were in, uh, in parish, in Lourdes Parish there in near Labangon. Mm, okay. So, and then I used to, because I played tennis, I used to announce the results of the tennis courts. And this was just a gradual process where, you know, you get invited to share. And I, I emceed programs. I hosted the, the 2010 presidential debate. Oh, in, yeah. In, in the, in, in Mandawi with a, with a big event there. Just the biggest event where the, the six candidates were present. I think that was the only debate. In the entire country, where the six candidates uh, were there to, to running for the elections, and now I do this a lot, so it's fun. And mm. It's not for money; I don't, I hardly get paid. So, but it's fun, and I think it's time to to just pay back. Oh yeah, you enjoy it, and it's also a way I, to give I, back. I enjoy it, like the the Mandawi Business Summits. It's been running for thirteen years now. And believe it or not, I, I, I'll be hosting the eleventh time for me on August 16 at the at the Oak Ridge in Mandawi City. Mm. I missed two because that a month before that I met an accident, so somebody else had to take over my place. And then the second time I missed it because I retired, you know, after about ten times, and I said, "Guys, find somebody else." So I retired. So they got somebody else from Manila, but they said, "Oh, no, Bunny, we want you back." So I've been back. I was back once last year, and now I'm back again this year. So, I guess it's not easy to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm excited to host this event on uh, on August 16th mm. at the Oak Ridge. Uh, as we were talking, you've mentioned that, of course, considering how you know how big, how how small you guys were in the beginning, and how how much you guys have grown over the years. But of course, it's not all smooth sailing. No. So, so obviously there are things that uh, that don't pan out. Can you talk about? Does anything come to mind? And and then how did? And then you also mentioned like making. Um, you said something about like making failure. Uh, doing getting getting the good out of it. Does some does uh, something come to mind when you think about that? Yeah, the funny part is that people now tell me, said, okay, bunny, anything you touch turns into gold. And I said, it's not true. <laughs> but I, I'm just as happy to close a business as to open one. Mm. And we've, I've made mistakes. And like one of the mistakes we made was this shawarma, shawarma business. Okay. I remember the shawarma owned by this friend of ours, uh, Steve Benitez, was always uh-huh. beside was always beside thirsty. This was maybe dating back ten years ago. Steve had a shawarma thing. Yeah, it's ten uh, years ago. Really, think, it's still there. I think I forgot the name, but anyway, it was always so many people lining up. So I said I should put up the same thing. So we put up. We made a mistake. We, we opened five at one time together, and we made a mistake. We we made a mistake on the costings. We were selling pretty well, but there was no money in the bank because we made a mistake. You know. When you have that meat at the start, actually it shrinks by about, I think, 
forty percent shrinkage, and we we base our cost things on the on the full meat. Oh, okay. So it was very difficult to make money at the well at the time. I don't know now. So I decided just to close it. One time, I also went into the the tire repair business with a partner, where you can get those punctured good tires and repair them. There was this Canadian technology. And we were doing pretty well, but I decided to just leave it because we ran out of customers. So, and the credit situation was difficult because people really don't pay on time. So, we made several mistakes. We also opened several restaurants where we invested a lot of money. They didn't do well. We closed them down, and and that's part of business. So, that's that's basically what it is. Uh, if you make a mistake, admit it, and don't let your ego get the better of you. So, I, I think that's one of the learning experiences that I can share. With people, yeah. Sometimes I notice that, like, I'll see. I mean, obviously, I don't know. I'm just just from looking at it. But sometimes, every now and then, I'll see a business that doesn't seem to be doing well, but they've been they're they're open, you know, for years. Yeah, right. And then I I always wonder. Uh, is that is the is well, the owner must be rich or something <laughs> because he just keeps putting money in there, and then uh, so you're. So you're saying, you know, cut your losses, know when to say this is over. Yeah, I think you have on. to control your ego a little bit because, uh, of course, it starts with the fact that you have to measure how your businesses are doing, right? Because unless you are able to, to, unless you have figures, unless you have data, you have information that's timely, it's so difficult to make good decisions. So what, what I do here, what we do here is that every day I get, I get uh, a report of all our daily sales, of all our restaurants, all our outlets. Of all and, and the of restaurants all, and Of outlets? all the restaurants. Like, uh, I think by 9 o'clock in the morning, I would have all the sales of the restaurants. So, we would have a trending. We would know. And if the you can see a trend because these things just don't happen overnight. You see a, a trend and we try and do something and correct the situation. And if we can't anymore, like if it's really no chance of making it, you have to be gutsy enough, I think, or you have to have the will, the willpower to close down the business. And this has happened with us several times. We, we opened a business. I don't know if you notice it. Uh, we have this cafe racer in the reclamation area. Mm. And there was this lot that was available. It's big. It's uh, 5,000 square meters. So we rented it from Justin Uy of uh, J Mall. Okay. And uh, we put up a business there. It was called Campo, like a military type. Is that the one with a big tank? Yeah, that's the one with a oh, big, yeah, yeah, with yeah. a big tank. Uh, not the tank water, but the tank. tank. Oh yeah, like the the army tank. So <laughs> we invested so much money there, but it started to pick up. But unfortunately, the road they fixed the road on that side. Yeah, that's true. And when we opened again, it just really just did not gain momentum. So about a year into it. I was looking at the figures. There's no way we can recover or even make money here. So I just said, okay, we close it. So we returned a lot to Justin, and he was gracious enough to accept it without any penalty. So, and I think that's important. Your ego has to go and check. That's that's trouble. So you have to have figures. You have to be very figure conscious when you're running a business. Secondly, and then sec, yeah, firstly, then secondly, you have to make sure that if it there's no way of Getting, or making it grow, or getting recover, you should be should have the willpower to close it. Uh, uh, cut the losses, cut the leak, because they eat up on your on the other on the other businesses that are doing well. What do you mean? No, if you if one of your businesses is doing well and the other is really draining and there's no chance of making it, and if you continue, then it's just like your profits a, are just going to yeah, the yeah, it's just profits just going to go to support this. So. I guess going back to what your observations are of other businesses that had been there for many years, it's very possible that the owners really just maybe don't don't check on them. Uh. Maybe they're not they don't looking at the figures, or maybe they're happy with it. But the trouble is, if you keep a business afloat that's not worth it, your resources are being eaten up by this business in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of executive time, which could be spent on other businesses that have more potential. Uh. So I think you have to be very, very aware of how the business potential is. And I learned several years ago that it's not worth going into a business that has no potential to grow. Because the money, the, the, the not the money, the time that you spend on a small business is actually practically the same as a big business. 
Oh yeah, how did you learn that? I noticed that in uh in, in your in the poster. How did you how did you come to that? Well, it's really delegating mm-hmm. and and having the mindset that for you to grow the business, you need good people. And you cannot grow a business unless you delegate. You can't do everything yourself. And it's a, a little bit it's a it's I feel pretty good in the sense that even if our business has grown over the last few years, I have a lot of time for myself and I'm able to travel. I'm able to spend time with my family a lot and, and being able to do that and, and don't feel that I, you know, I'm lack time. I so I also have time to do some, some civic activities. I'm active in the Cebu Chamber of Commerce. I'm active in hosting events and speaking. You can't do that unless you, you pick on good people to be in your organization, unless you're able to delegate the very, very important stuff that you do. Otherwise, you get swamped with all of these things. So I, I don't know if that's a good learning learning lesson for so many people, but I think it is. Oh, yeah. I feel like sometimes, like me personally, I feel like I'm doing... There are times I feel like there, there are certain tasks that I should be giving to somebody else. And you don't? Yeah, and Did I you ever don't. ask yourself why not? No, well, that's the thing. Well, to be fair... I've asked myself this like a few years ago. You know, I was doing things like just going to the bank. You know, like that. <laughs> yeah, right. And then I that's... haven't been to the bank in ages. Yeah, so eventually I decided, you know, I need to I'll just hire an assistant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Did you? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. And then um, every now and then, I should probably do it yearly or something. I like take into account, you know, like what I do on a day-to-day basis and see which ones need my time or what, whatever it is that I can do, and then see which ones should go to somebody else, you know? Like, sometimes I'll hear, like, some business owners, like, you know, they're, they're the drivers. They drive to, I don't know, they'll, they'll do the deliveries, that sort of thing. Oh, that's really, that's not the best use of their time. Uh, in, in that connection, one of the things I always ask myself is that I always ask, what is the best use what is the most productive use of my time right now? And whatever mm-hmm. that is, then I do it. If the most productive use of my time right now is to take a nap or to sleep, then I do it. But it's got to be the most productive use of your time at that moment. So if you continually ask yourself that question, Carlo, then chances are you're able to make better use of your time and you become more productive. Yeah. Now, time so is- think, of, think about it. Yeah, no, I I do believe me. <laughs> I do. It's like, uh, yeah, I I do. I could go. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, yeah, like I don't like getting stuck in traffic. That that sort of thing. Yeah, but you see, there are certain things in any business that only you should do or can do better than anyone else. The rest you should delegate. Like, if you were to listen to a short story, when when I was in the life insurance business. You know, life insurance, selling life insurance is a very personalized thing. I mean, it's something that you cannot delegate. When you have a prospect, when you're talking to a breadwinner, you've got to be the one to do belly-to-belly transaction with this person. Uh So that's something that you cannot delegate. But everything else, you can delegate when you think about it. So when I started in the life insurance business many, many years ago, and I started in Bacolod, by the way, of which I, I wasn't from there. So I was doing everything, making appointments, like when I close a sale, I filled up the forms, I go to the bank to deposit the, the deposit slip, I fill up everything and then even go to the shipping company to ship the package. And then my boss at the time, his, he was British, his name was Bob Morris, and he looked at us, he looked at me and said, Bunny! Why are you doing all of these things? Hire a secretary to do those things. And then the only thing you cannot delegate is being in front of the prospect, closing sales, making presentations. And I said, that made sense. So I hired the secretary and I, of course, increased my cost. But I had, I had time to do the only thing I could not delegate to anyone else. So my activity increased. And my sales doubled. And then I hired another secretary. And then I hired a messenger. 
And would you believe that my business grew 10 times? Ah, uh, yeah? Yeah, because I was doing now, at that point, the only thing that I could not delegate. So I, I had more time to, to, to talk to prospects, closing sales, and I became more effective because as you, you know, in the life insurance business or any selling job, the more you do it, the more you close, you gain momentum, you gain confidence, and the aura changes. And people always want to do business with people they think are successful. So it just built on that momentum. And that's what happened. So I learned that from the insurance industry. So when I went into business myself, so I said, okay, what are the things that I can delegate? What are the things I cannot delegate? Like right now, I focus my attention on closing deals, getting locations, negotiating for locations. And then after that, I sit down with, with, with my children and said, okay, guys, who would want to do this? And then I delegate, but we check. And they, each one is talented. They have their own talents, but I check. So I work with all of them. And I don't really run a business myself now, a, a specific business, because they manage these businesses themselves. And, and we manage to grow and do this. And I find myself having more time. And that's the best use of my time, because no one else can do it better than I am at this point to close the deals, mm. locations, negotiate the terms and conditions. So... I think a lot of people can learn from this because if I were to do everything, including operations, including finance, so we have people doing all of these things, uh, human resource development. And in fact, at this time, we have about 120 people in our house of Lechon, Akasha, doing their our seventh, I think, leadership training because I committed this time with you. I yeah. told them, this guy, this is the first time I'm going to miss that. So I can't reschedule Carlo anymore. Oh, thanks. So that's okay. But, uh, <laughs> well, I missed that. So, but right now, at this point, because they're finished at about 1030, mm -hmm. they're there now, training. Now, that's something that can be delegated. We, we hired speakers to do it. So that's basically what it is. I think you have to start with a mindset of doing this. Uh, first, the mindset has to be growth. Always constantly growing, but you cannot grow unless you picked on the right people. You are able to, de you're willing to delegate because I think willingness is so important in doing this, right? I mean, if you don't trust people generally to do it, then you can never delegate. You want to do everything by yourself. I think the, I think a lot of people also like the challenge is they want to delegate, but there's also because there's this balance. Are you where speaking about yourself? Yeah, well, in general, okay. well, you know, I mean, I'm happy. I have an assistant. It's, it's <laughs> big difference, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a huge difference. <laughs> no, but it's but there's still things that I'm sure I can still, uh, you know, delegate to other people. For example, you mentioned, do I listen to this podcast? Yeah, I do. Ed I do the editing. That's a good chunk of my time, and that's something that actually other people can do. And but I was wondering because I feel like. The balance. There's a balance between, uh, because once you get other people, once you delegate, as you mentioned, it incurs cost, right? And then I think a lot of it is the question is at what point, because in the beginning, you kind of have no choice if you're starting from zero. Right, you've got to start, and it's good also to go through the process. Yeah. Of really knowing and learning the the, the actual steps of of the business, right? Yeah, exactly. So you start from zero. You're you're doing. Yeah, that's that. that's what happened to us, and that's what that's what we did. Uh -huh. you, you have to go through all of those things, because we started from zero. Actually, it's not that we were there; it was handed down. And by the way, our businesses are first gen business because we built all everything that we have. I built this together with my children. Yeah. So I can always say, "Okay, guys, we built this together, and now the next gen will will take over." In, in the next many, many years. So it's different. Like the parents built the business and then the children just took over or accept. It's different because I started late. So my children were already like when I started John, Charlie. So it's, it's fun. It's fun. Actually, that's, that's, that's something interesting because it, it's, it, it feels like a long time. Of, you know, to me, Thirsty has been around forever. Yeah. Like I was in high school and then <laughs> funny story. I remember. There was this, uh, when I was a kid in high school, there was this big event called Jamaican Nights oh, yeah. or something. And then there was a rumor when I was a kid that one of the sales girls in Ayala 
was the model in Jamaica Nights. Okay. And then, so there was like a line of like high school kids, high school boys, just by <laughs> thirsty. <laughs> the thirsty. Uh, it actually drinks. happened, right? I remember, I think Cheryl or John, my. So there was. That happened, right? I don't or know. It, I mean, never. I don't know if the girl really was the, <laughs> the model. Because the, the mod- there was a ticket. And then the ticket, there was a picture of a girl. Okay. Right? And then, you know, just regular. It's just a ticket for, for the for the Jamaican Nights. And then she just happened. I, the rumor was she was the girl. Okay. So I remember my, me and my friends, we'd go there, line up. And it's you know, see, she's the one, she's not the one. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, but it just seems like yesterday... It, to me, it seems like they've been around. You guys have been around forever. Yeah, but you know, twenty years since it, we since we took it over or or over because, as I mentioned, we took over Thursday in nineteen ninety six. Yeah, it was also the year when I retired from from Annual Life. Yeah, it's if so you it's think over, about it's it, over twenty years. Yeah, but not it's if you think about it, it's not that long ago. No, no, yeah. it's not. It's not. But it's been fun because it's it's been a it's been a an exciting journey. And yeah. when you when you love what you do, time really doesn't matter at all. So I'm curious, have you, like, you hear about all of these um, big, big dynasties and then they have some sort of succession plan? Like, the famous one is, like, the Aboitises, for example, oh, yeah. which is, you know, they're very strict. Like, um, I don't know, they have all these rules that are written down for the, for who wants to... For the next generation. For the next generation, <laughs> like, they have to go to... I don't. I don't know. These are all rumors in my head. Like they have to go to college abroad. or yeah, something. Yeah, and they cannot work in the company unless they have two years' experience working for somebody else. So yeah, that's, something like that. That's a very specific rule for that. Yes. Yeah. So is that something that you're thinking about? Is that we something have, we that actually are are doing that now, Carlo? Because we have a a family constitution already. And we hired the Ateneo Family Business Development Center in, in Manila to do a family constitution with us. So we have that. This was a, a two-day workshop facilitated by Dr. Ricky Mercado okay. of Ateneo. And we went through that and we signed. We have that. It's it's The specifics are very clear on what to do, what not to do, and what businesses we're going into. Like one of the things we agreed in that constitution is that in-laws – would not be part of our businesses mm. and that the ownership should stay within the family. There are actually seven of us, five kids and the parents who are, who are who own the business. So we've done that. It's, it's not easy to execute, but at least, you know, we did that exercise. It guides us. We still have to review it because you need, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an evolving document. It's also good. I feel like that, that, that you've done this early on before, because it's hard to do it later on because you know if you make a rule and it's it might seem like it's it's focused on this one person because it just so happens to be this one person falls in that category so it's good to do it early on while... yeah what's even more important is you do it when relationships are good oh yeah yeah because Ateneo will not do anything like that if the relationship is not good because really? they can't do it they can't if if the siblings or the the, the, the family members are in, in bad shape, bad conditions, relationships, they will not do it. So at least the, the terms are clear. Everybody understands the whole situation. And so many families I've referred to them here in Cebu and elsewhere are doing it too. I think it's a good thing. Families should consider doing the family, they call it the family business constitution. Mm. Yeah, that's something, well, yeah. So that guide that guides that's been guiding us. Okay. Yeah. Speaking also, uh, this interview happened because see Cheryl Cheryl reached <laughs> out, she had a question, and you then, should interview Cheryl. She's just, she's pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I like Cheryl. Yeah, but uh, yeah, she. But I, I I mentioned that you know it'd be it I would be really cool to interview you. Thank you. <laughs> Has it been cool so far? Yes. Yeah, I've learned a lot. Like uh, I'm I'm gonna re-listen to this and then. There's some some books that you recommended and then that I've also heard of before. So now I'm just more motivated to. That's good. Well, probably get an audio book. Yeah, and or, then, or just maybe Google and get the summaries. Oh yeah, or that'd be easier. Yeah, easier, <laughs> easier, faster. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, so it happened because of Cheryl, and then I remember this was way back in uh, June, I think. She asked, she's she. So the idea of interviewing you came out in June. 
now it's July. It's mm-hmm. like at the end of July. And then she she I told her, ah, the timing's not working because we're leaving for a family vacation in right. in a in a week. And then mm-hmm. you know, I had to I was I didn't wanna I was doing a lot of work before the vacation so that I can actually have a vacation. <laughs> so she said, Oh, it only takes one to two hours, right? Uh, we can do it because uh, then she said, let's do it sooner. As my dad always says, the universe likes speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things I believe in. The universe likes speed. Did that strike you? Yeah, no, but uh, I'm curious why, why, how, how, why did you, and then that has come out in your writing also. Yeah, right. The universe likes speed. Why? And my speeches. <laughs> yeah, and your speeches as well. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's... Uh, where did it come from? I, I think it came from the... You know, many things, in fact, maybe most of the things I I, I talk about are things that I read or, or learned from people. And I think this I got this from the book of David Allen again. You know, and, and he's got this concept, and maybe you could check it out. It's called Closing Open Loops. Mm. Have you ever heard this term? I've heard it from you. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> well, very quickly, an open loop is anything that's pending, any promise, any commitment that you've made that still has not been done. And when you make a commitment, when that open loop is there in your subconscious mind, it continually bugs you. It continually bothers you. And until you do something about it and close it, it will continue to do it. And the trouble is, if the open loops in your life continue to pile up, they really affect your life. They affect your health. They affect your capacity to get things done. So what I've been doing all these years now, and maybe, I don't know, the last few years, is I just... What I do is I spend my time just closing open loops. Every waking hour of my of my time is spent on asking myself what needs to be done. Close this, close this. Either I delegate it, either I negotiate with myself that it's closed, or I send a text, or I make a phone call, I send an email or a Viber message. I just do this all the time. So when I ask myself, what are the open loops in my life? There are not too many. And then when when this happens to you, when you have got this clarity of thinking because you're not bothered, then you can move forward and you're ready for anything. Anything that comes your way, you're ready. And this is where I think the basic concept of the speed of universe, there's a speed of trust. When people trust you, then everything is speeded up. There's speed of action, speed in making decisions, and speed of thought. So I really believe that I think most of the things we do here, of course, you also make mistakes because you, maybe you're doing it too fast, but from there you can learn. So I, I really believe in the concept that the universe likes speed, or maybe God likes you to move fast and quick. And this has happened with all our outlets, like uh, quickly, there's still a little bit of time, Tapu Cebu. Mm. For years, I've been thinking of, I mean, why is it that we can't open a restaurant there? And I've been talking to the Osmanians to open inside TAP itself. Do you know the meaning of TAP? We call it TAPS, but it's really TAP. TAP means the Osmania place. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what that's what it is. Oh. TAP. It's not TAPS, but we call it TAPS. But T-O-P, the TAP, that uh, circular thing where you go in there, you pay 100 pesos, is actually called TAP. And I ask Milo, what, what does it mean? The Osmania place. So I've been wanting to do that there. But anyway, one 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 afternoon, just a Sunday, got a call from Mimo if I wanted to rent the space. I said, yeah, sure. So the next morning, we met there at 6 o'clock in the morning. That was a, no, this was Saturday, so I met him on a Sunday. And we talked and we negotiated and, and we closed the deal. And that's what. But everything is, is fast. And what I do is when I come across something, the concept of closing the loop, the open loop is there. So it's got to be fast. Otherwise, it keeps on bothering me. Mm. Wait, so he called you on a Saturday? And he then called you me had... on a Saturday afternoon, I think, and I was I was taking a nap <laughs> at the time, and the phone rang and I answered, it was, it was him. He said, uh, want to take a look? He said, I'll meet you there tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. So and you I... closed it on Sunday? No, not. Well, no, we sorry. had an agreement, but the negotiations took a little bit of time until we finally closed it. So... But the fact is, I just acted on it right away. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I do that all the time. And you didn't even have the concept yet. 
No, we did not. Uh, you concept. just knew that. Yes, that it's a great, a great spot. Uh. Great spot. You're familiar. You remember there were three buildings here that they had. Those were sort of yeah, apartments, like, condominiums that they were leasing to different tenants. So that's what we rented. Mm. And then uh, I just gave it to Charlie, my son, who's our, who's our, who's our whiz. I call him a genius. So I just gave it to him. Charles, it's yours. You know, do something about it. And I left him there. And then eventually just, and he still runs it. He, he, he does the menus. He does a lot of things. So he's our Michael Jordan or our LeBron James. Oh. He's going to just pass him the ball. Oh, well, I play basketball with Charlie. Oh, you do? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I have. We've been in a, we've been in a basketball team. Together, that's we did great. not win many games, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. You had fun. <laughs> oh yeah, He's like, I like I really like Charlie as a basketball team. So that's that's the guy that, that that's the guy that we pass the ball to. So he's he's developed the concept on Lantau, Cafe Racer, Shaka, Miss mm. Mukono, and we're putting up a we're developing right now a one hectare property in Talisay. We're putting up a a food park there. Oh, okay. Yeah, there. It's hopefully we can open that early September. And there will be 30 stores there that we're renting out. It's a really nice because it's a very, very windy place. We did not cut any tree at all. Really, really nice. Where are Talisa? So up in the mountains somewhere? Okay, no, it's not. It's very convenient. It's in the main road. Oh, okay. Like if you go to SRP, if you hit the end of SRP, that's a 13-kilometer stretch from the beginning to end. If you turn left, you go to Karkar, right? Yeah. If you turn right, you go back to the city. Mm -hmm. So this is just about 250 meters to the left side. There's this jetty station there. If you, there's a small road oh, yeah. going up, we have Camellia Homes there. Yeah, yeah. I think there are 14 subdivisions or villages there. So that corner lot is the one that we're developing right now. It's it's a really a, a beautiful restaurant. Not a restaurant, but beautiful. Oh, he, he wants to call it Yahai. No, because Yahai, Yahai mm, in yeah, Cebuano uh, is windy, right? He wanted to call it Yahai, but we just couldn't get the name. So we got the next best thing, Yahai. Ah. So it's called Yahai Food Park. So a little bit before House of Lechon. No, this is the other. The, this is the opposite direction. House of Lechon is going to the left. It's, ah, so it's to the right. It's to the right. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, this okay. one's to the right. Uh, if you're in that vicinity, check it out. But right now, it's still covered, partially covered. But we are we're, we're opening soon. But most, if not all, of the stores there will be ours. Mm. Ours, like we have uh, Thirsty there. We'll have we'll have Summers, which is our Halo Halo. We'll have House of Lechon Chopping. We'll have uh, we'll have a Japanese Miss Mukono will open there. No sushi boy. We'll have a Korean restaurant there. We'll have a, a Chinese restaurant takeout. I guess it's also a good place for you guys to test different concepts. Right, you're right. Very, very perfect. So if if it really clicks, then we can spin it off and open a full restaurant on it. So, and Michael, my youngest son, is the one developing the the Japanese, the Korean, and the Chinese. So it's like a food court mm. where you buy and then you go to a place where it's covered or the top portion and then you just eat and we'll have maybe entertainment there in the evening. It's a big capacity. We have maybe about 60, 70 parking slots available for it. Yeah. And then that area, there's really not much, not, not much, not much in that area. So it might be a good place to go. It is. It is. So hopefully I'll let you know when it, when we open, you can, oh, yeah. you can write it, you can feature it in your, <laughs> I'll visit there. I'll bring the kids. Yeah. Okay. So when we're ready. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Bunny, I, I think that's a good place for us to. And thank you so much for uh, doing this interview. Do you want to add anything? No, I just want to thank you and, and thank you for promoting Cebu. I know 032, that is our. The area code. The area code for Cebu. So I don't know if many people really know that or can connect it to that. Yeah. But well, I, remember, I remember your dad. Was a very close friend of mine. We we're together in the sports car club for maybe for the last ten years. Sort of explained that to me, and I said, "Oh, what a brilliant, what a brilliant name!" Oh well, <laughs> <laughs> it kind of just landed <laughs> there. We kind of just, you know, picked it out of a hat, more or less. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much. Also, where can people find you? Do you have like a, an online press? Generally, since I. Usually, I ask I ask the guests where can people find you, and they share like a Twitter account or an Instagram account. Well, me, it's easy. All you need to do is buy a thirsty product, mm -hmm. and my cell phone number is there. Really? Yeah. Would you believe all these years, if you buy a thirsty cup in any of the thirsty outlets wherever Visayas and Mindanao, 
My cell phone number is there, 0917-321-6224, and you can get in touch with me. So I, I specifically place it there so that people can give us feedback. on, And, and I do, and I always respond to every comment or complaint or, or compliment that I get because of that number on the cup. Really? Yes. Do you have your name there on the no, cup? No, no, not my name. Number? No, no, my number is so just, But that's your personal. Yeah, wow. that's my personal number. It, it's really good in touch. <laughs> so we've been we've been building, I think, one customer at a time for Thursday all these years. I get maybe 90% complimentary, but there are some people who are dissatisfied, you know, complaining about this particular crew who is so suplada or suplado and not giving the service. So we always do something about it. And many times I've given them complimentary drinks for giving us feedback. Mm. So that helps. Well, if you're asking me something, I think my message is that it's never too late to to start a business. It's it, You just keep on thinking about it and developing and getting yourself prepared. Can I share one of my favorite quotations? Sure. Yeah, I, I would say that it's better to be prepared and not have an opportunity than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. So just get ready there, read, study, talk to people who can help you and and get into that frame of mind and that mindset that one of these days when I get this opportunity, I'm ready. And I, I guess that's what that's what happened in my case. I was ready, but I'm still trying to prepare and getting ready for bigger things. I don't know what they are, but I'm always constantly preparing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Carlo. Thank, thank you very much. It's a, <laughs> thank you, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'll be... I'm looking forward to listening to this. Yeah, I'll um, I'll let uh, I'll let you know when it's out. I'll send Cheryl a link or something. Yeah. and also me. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, Carlo, I'm stop this. Thanks. Okay, it was a treat to talk to Bunny. Shortly after this interview, well, actually, basically after we stopped recording, he started asking me. All sorts of questions about about podcasting, about the equipment I use, about interviewing in general. Because as as you already heard, he ha- he did that before. He's I don't even know when that was actually. It might have been somewhere in the early two thousands or late nineties. He was doing interviews already, and he gave me the impression that he might do something. In this format, in in this podcast format, he might interview people. So I'm genuinely excited to see if he pushes through with doing these interviews. Considering his stature in the business world, you can imagine the types of people he could invite to interview. So uh, let's see what happens. Let's see if he pushes through with it. Thank you, Bunny, for doing the podcast. Thank you, Cube Gallery. Thank you, Honduro Pizza. Thank you, Kent Combs, for sponsoring the podcast. The music from this podcast is Piano March by Audio Nautics. If you want to support the podcast, consider supporting us on patreon.com slash 032. We have some exclusive content and exclusive merchandise that you can get there as well. And if you don't want to shell out any money but still want to help, please share this episode on social media. Every little thing helps. I thought that was a good episode. Did you think that was a good episode? I thought it was, I thought that was really good. So uh, we'll have another good episode next Tuesday. See ya. Bye.